And I think I knew this, but I was reminded when I looked you up, you're related to the Quaid brothers. Yes. Cousins. Yeah. First, first cousins? First cousins. So you guys grew up together? Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. interesting. And I, I, I've lived with Dennis in Los Angeles uh, in the early 80s. Okay. Uh, yeah, I got to be a fly on the wall on on sets, and you know, I, yeah, I really, yeah, it that's cool. Learned a lot as a as young, you know, watching different directors. And are you guys around the same age? Or they're older than you, right? They're older. Yeah. 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 Anything you can share <laughs> that that wouldn't get you in too much trouble? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're pretty. They're you know they're good guys. Uh, you know, I know there's been about a lot of bad press about Randy doing some crazy stuff, you know. Yeah, Dennis keeps a low profile. Yeah. Well, Randy, though, I mean, Cousin Eddie. I mean, that's like... <laughs> oh, it was classic, One of the right? best roles ever. I know. You know who he was playing, right? One of my uh, uncles by marriage. See, that's funny because... <laughs> Patent leather shoes, the white belt. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's perfect. Well, come on, tell us more about that. <laughs> I think every family has a cousin Eddie somewhere in the in the in the woodpile. Oh yeah. You know? No, and that's why he's so relatable. And if you don't, then that means you are cousin Eddie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you are listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this. What is this? Uh, number twenty-two, I think, of our Ask a Gettysburg guides. But this is a special edition. Ask a Gettysburg Guide. This is Ask a Gettysburg Actor. Gettysburg being italicized there because we're talking about the movie Gettysburg. And um, we have a very special guest, but I'm not going to uh, tell you who it is just yet. I'm going to tease you and get through some business first. So there. First of all, we have Bob, our co-host. Hello, Bob. Hello, Matt. Hello, everybody. And we have Eric, the producer, sitting in with us today as well. Hello, hello. I just want you all to know that this is brought to you without commercial interruption by the good folks over at the American Battlefield Trust. I'm sure you already know what great work they do in saving the sacred grounds of our country. Well, they also did your buddies at Address in Gettysburg a great favor by allowing us to use General Lee's headquarters here on Seminary Ridge. The American Battlefield Trust preserves the battlefields and educates the public about America's formative conflicts and why they matter today. You can visit them at battlefields.org for videos, maps, and thousands of articles. Besides the Lee's headquarters site, which they preserved and restored, they have preserved more than 800 additional acres in and around Gettysburg. And they are currently trying to preserve land along the Baltimore Pike on Cemetery Hill and at the base of Big Round Top. So you can find out more and donate to the cause by going to battlefields.org. And I'd like to personally thank Tim Smith for getting us in touch with Gary Edelman. And then I'd like to thank Gary Edelman for setting this up with a day's notice. And Tom over there letting us in. Thank you, Tom. And uh, someday, ladies and gentlemen, we will get Gary on the show because uh, he, we get many requests for Gary. So that will be good. Okay. So let's move on to our guest. If you're a patron of ours, you've heard our guest before on this show alongside Patrick Gorman. Uh, you, of course, know him as Major Walter Taylor from the movie Gettysburg. Uh, but he's also a writer, director, and producer known for the 2016 film The Last Man Club, starring the late Morgan Shepard, who you would know as uh, General Isaac Trimble. Uh, he was in Swing State, and he produced and directed the upcoming film, The Bay House, among many others. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the great Bo Brinkman. Hello, Bo. Hello. <laughs> Sorry for that really <laughs> long intro, but, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Indeed. Uh, Bo, um, you were on the show before, but we didn't get to talk uh, then a lot about your background coming up as an actor. So let's get started with that first. First, where were you born? Where are you from? I'm from Houston, Houston, Texas, Texas. born yeah. and raised, born and raised. All right. And then how did you get into Hollywood? Um, well, I, you know, I went to, you know, studied theater and journalism in, in college. And then, uh, I, I went out there and, uh, lived with my, uh, my cousin, Dennis and, uh, Dennis who? Quaid, who we're just talking about. Dennis Quaid. Oh, that's that, no, that's probably... That's, oh, okay. Who so, knows? You never know. Um, got an agent and uh, started working, and then I moved to uh, New York is where I really started working, and I worked in theater, a lot more theater than film. I've always been uh, more of a the theater actor. Oh, yeah? I, yeah, I've just... What do you like about that over film? Uh, the spontaneity and, and the, no take two. Yeah, it's 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 just right there, and you can feel the audience. Yeah, and, um, it scares it's me. It's just more. I don't know. To me, well, it's 
it's all a craft. It's all a craft. But um, I don't know. It's just something that I, I just I, I started out uh, on stage. You know. Now, are you from Houston proper, or just outside of Houston? Outside of Houston, Pasadena. So, okay. So, wh- is that kind of country, or what's that like there? No, it's actually cowboy boots and chemicals. It's uh, <laughs> okay. you know, I mean, it's refineries and oh, right. blue collar, very blue collar. Um, so what's it like going from that to New York and, you know, in the acting crowd in New York? Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, I mean, I've had so many Forrest Gump moments in my young life. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Right. You know, just yeah. with, you know, the people that I've worked with, the people that I've met. Uh, just uh, it's yeah, it's a, just a, was a very interesting life. How, how long were you there before you got into film? Um, I, I first was in Los Angeles and I, I, I hated LA. I didn't, I just didn't feel it. And I moved to New York and I immediately started working in theater and you got in the equity. I did a couple of equity shows off Broadway. What is that equity? What at, is at the union. Oh, and, okay. Okay. And, um, I did a lot of off Broadway and I was also writing. I got into the, uh, actor studio, which mm-hmm. is very difficult to get into that. I know. And became a lifetime member of the actor studio. And, um, even we, I started a, a little theater company called cactus theater in a, in the basement of a restaurant, um, in the village. Hmm. And we had a little 50 seat house theater that we had for like five years. As a matter of fact, James Gandolfini was one of my members. Oh, yeah. One of the, the uh, yeah, he was, uh, Gandolfini was actually uh, driving a seltzer truck <laughs> and delivering five gallon bottles of, of water up to offices and stuff wow. when I met him. And um, we, we put him in a play called Big L's Best Friend. It was his first play. And uh, then a, a girlfriend of ours that was a member of our of Cactus Theater got the Broadway show with Jessica Lange and um, a, a cat, not, no, not cat on a hot tin roof, but, um, cats. No, <laughs> <laughs> cats. That's it. Cats with Jessica Lange streetcar named Desire oh, okay. with Alec Baldwin and Jessica Lang. This was a long time yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, she, uh, was the, uh, the woman upstairs that Stella would go upstairs, you know, no, not Stella, but her sister, the wife of Stanley Mm -hmm. would, um, uh, you know, go up there and hide from him and Mm -hmm. the neighbor's upstairs apartment. So anyway, long story short, she, they couldn't find, um, the actor to play Vince. And she came to him and said, look, and he'd only done a play in his life and said, our play said, I've got your vents. I've got your vents, you know, just read him. So they read him. He got it. And he got uh, cast off that stay. He did the show for, I think, two years and was cast off of Broadway and never looked back. I mean, he... Did he, Gandolfini you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. James okay. Gandolfini. Okay. Never looked back. I mean, you know, he had a wonderful career up to yeah. the day he died. Yeah, he died a little too young. He sure did. He, and he know. was a great guy. He was a great That's guy. That's what I hear. I hear he was really he was nice. Great. Not people, like Tony Soprano. Hey, well, how, what's the earliest you can remember wanting to be an actor or director or producer? Good question. Well, I mean, I've been writing since I could hold a pencil. I mean, I wrote stories and, and, and songs and poems and mainly short stories when I was a little kid. So um, I, when I was a kid, I was brought to a play and I thought, God, I, I can do this, you know? And so that's what interests me. I mean, thank goodness I would probably be working at a refinery right now if it weren't, you know. Yeah, was that in your family? Like yeah, acting fa- or anything? Well, yes, actually it was. Okay. Um, uh, my father was a refinery worker. He was, you know, worked for Shell Oil. Um, but, but he acted my, on the tanks? Uh, huh? <laughs> he yeah. acted on the tanks? He was not from the acting side. We had <laughs> okay. actually, we, we had one actor from his side. So it was Gene Autry was my... Uh, grandfather's brother oh okay and sharon tate is my second cousin i think uh on the other side oh really and then then the quades came along and uh you know randy you know and they were already in the business before you is that right or did you all get in together oh no they were i mean randy i mean gosh i was a kid when he got that show um 
when he got Last Picture Show. Okay. That was in 1970 or 71 when he did that. Um, and and then oh, yeah. Dennis followed. I think Dennis moved out there in 75. Okay. You know? But, um, and then I came in 1980, 81. Okay. So, so yeah, you were. Yeah, it's yeah. staggered. Yeah. But, um, no, I mean, I knew what I, by the time I got to college, I knew what I wanted to do, but I wanted to just not be an actor. I wanted to, I was taking directing classes and I was, you know, writing plays, I, I, you know, so you, could be, like, you could do it all. You could work. You'll yeah, always work. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just, I love, I, I really, I love, uh, the, I'd rather be a writer and a director because there's more control mm -hmm. than to be an actor. And that's why I'm not really acting anymore unless somebody, a friend of mine, you know, says, hey, be in, be in this film, you know. I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, you know, that sounds like fun, you know. Right. But um, the, the business has changed a lot, too. I mean, I, you almost have to kind of own, own your projects to make money anymore. Right. Uh, or the studio pay you a lot of money. Well, how, to, to how do you make money? I mean, do people go to the movies anymore? Yeah, of course. I mean, enough where you can make money? Oh, no. It's it's really tough. I yeah. mean, actually, like, for instance, with uh, my movie, The Bay House, it's going to open in about 20 theaters across the country, uh, select theaters. And, you know, we're not in it for the money in the theaters. What we're in it for is to get the uh, reviews. Uh-huh. So that we get a better deal with Amazon, ah, uh, okay, or I'll, I'll, you know, and the uh, the downloads, right, the rents, right, 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 and that's really, I mean, that's really where, you know, the money is is in in rent renting and you know a Redbox or not even Redbox anymore. No, no, because nobody watches DVDs. No, no, yeah. no DVDs are. It's all Amazon, Netflix. Yeah. Hulu. And the business has changed so much. Uh, I remember in the eighties, I did my, I wrote my first film and, and produced it and co-directed it in 1988. And I was also in it with my ex-wife. And um, back then, man, you could do, you could go to like Fox Lorber, which is a distribution company of, of back then VHS, and you could get your whole budget fronted uh, on, on, uh, on a VHS film. From the distributor? And, Huh? Yeah. From, oh, okay. And then you'd have the rest of the rights that's foreign and domestic. And about 85% of your uh, income, your revenues are domestic anyway. I mean, uh, foreign, foreign anyway. So back, so I've watched the business change from the 80s on. Uh, you know, it was a very short window for getting your budget based on a few celebrity names for VHS rights. Right. And then it changed. And then for a long time, um, and, and you would get $88 per unit if you did a deal with a VHS company. So if you sent, and back, back then there were about 15,000 mom and pop, uh, video stores, video stores, yeah. and then Hollywood video and, uh, blockbuster, blockbuster uh, literally put them all out of business. Yeah. yeah. And once they got cornered the market, then they came to the producers and said, you know what? We're not going to give you $88 a unit anymore. We're going to give you a portion of what we rent. So all of a sudden, the revenues uh, went down the tubes, right? Okay. Um, uh, and then comes then the DVD market came, and for a short while, the DVDs were you could make a ton of money, you know, on the DVD sales. People liked, you know, it was a perfect, you know, the mini DVDs came out at the same time the regular DVDs uh -huh. and and the regular ones, the bigger ones won out because yeah. they were more substantial. Right, you know? right. But, but people would just buy them, you know. And then uh, it's, uh, you know, when a guy told me that, that it, DVDs were going to be replaced by watching a movie on a computer, I was like, there's no way, man. <laughs> Come on. I what know. are you talking about? I know. And sure enough. I, I, have, I, I recently found a big Tupperware bin of all my DVDs. Yeah. I have, I don't know, like probably 500 or so. Yeah. Them. And all it does is give me back pain when I try to pick it up. Right. There's no, I have no use for it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And not all, but a good chunk of those films I've already bought the digital version of on Prime. Yeah. And... Um, I just, the other ones, I just go, why did I buy that in the first place? Yeah, I used to have a closet of VHS. 
I mean, literally just stacked to the yeah. ceiling. Did you guys notice how he always looks up to me, the old guy, when he says VHS? <laughs> <laughs> but I got you. Both. Yeah. I, I, he remembers the 16 millimeter. I was going to say, I feel young again. <laughs> we ought to have Bo come on more often. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, the uh, yeah, so the, the, the industry has changed. And then today... Uh, how how do you even get the money for movies? Because uh, do you, you don't go to Amazon for? I mean, I guess you could if they want to make it an Amazon production. Sure. But but I mean, you want to get a movie made? Yeah, there's there's uh, there's more than one way to skin a, a cat. You, you know, know? Um, uh, one way is to go to private investors, and um, I've done that a lot. And and I'm not just trying to sell them. The movie and hey, you're gonna you're gonna make a lot of money. I sell an experience. You're okay. gonna have, and I told this one oil guy this, and uh, I said, you know, how many wells have, do you have? You know, and he's like, oh, I don't know, half a dozen. I'm like, have you ever just gone out and looked at your well? And he goes, no. <laughs> I said, of course not. I said, you, you get involved. You can actually be on set. You can watch us and watch the process oh. from beginning to end. Okay. And you can also see, it's exciting to see the producer's report that you'll get after you, you know, you, after your investment, a year down the road, you'll start to get producer's reports uh, from the distribution companies that are selling the film overseas and domestically. And, and there's a lot, there's so many markets, like um, every country uh, outside of the U.S. is a different market. Right. So you've got, used to, you had, you know, DVD sales, TV sales and theatrical. Well, now you just have, you know, pretty much still a dribbling of DVD sales, but mostly it's downloads, right? But every, every uh, country uh, is a different market. So think of how many countries, you know, mm -hmm. and they're all, they all pay different amounts. You know, mm -hmm. like okay. Mexico might only pay, you know, 10 grand, but then, you know, uh, China or, or Japan or any of those countries will pay more. It all depends on what country it is. And then you've got your domestic market. And, um, you know, that consists of the same thing. Downloads, network television is really big. Mm. Uh, you know, cable, you know, like sure. HBO and all that. So there's a lot of different ways to recover, you know, to, to, um, to get your investment back. And the way I do it is I take an upfront amount to keep the lights on and then pay myself as a writer director. And then I don't participate in the profits until all of the investors are paid back. They get first money out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's worked out so far. It's worked out very well. And, uh, so I like to do that because I'm not beholding to some, uh, you know, uh, distribution company that wants me to do rewrites or, doesn't approve, you know, like, oh, you know what? That's a little too racy. We, you know what? Let's, can we rewrite? I've done that. I've done mm -hmm. the, it's called development hell where, <laughs> right. you know, you go back and forth and you're dealing with non-writers. You're, you're dealing with Which people that are worse. not creatives yeah. and they are, can only base what you, they've read your script. They can only base it on, on maybe prior movies that they've seen. So they want it to be like this. Oh, <laughs> right. I want it to be more like that movie, you know? Yeah. And, and they don't have a clue, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so there's more, uh, there's more freedom, uh, much more creative freedom doing it the way I, I've been doing it in the past. The, the most creative freedom is in podcasting. There's just no money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, how is it different than what happened? The movie Gettysburg came out in 93. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. I remember when they were filming here. Well, mm -hmm. I think that was my second year in 92. Is that right? Does that sound right? About 92 you were filming? We were shooting in 92. Yes. We okay. started in May of okay. 92. Then I do remember that. So you mentioned before investors. This is different though, isn't it? Ted Turner was the investor. Absolutely. Right? And there's a great story about uh, Gettysburg. Um, Ron Maxwell read Killer Angels, fell in love with the script. I mean, with the book, the novel. Went to the guy, got the rights, a, a sheriff. Sure. And uh, got the rights to the to do it. He and somebody else, I think, wrote the screenplay. He developed it over, you know, a, a year or two. I forget how long it took him to write it. But when he got what he, you know, he finally got it, 
the way he wanted it, and it was a tight script. It was terrific. It was a great read. Um, and then he spent the next 10 years taking trips to Gettysburg, telling everybody, I'm going to make this movie. And after 10 years, people were like, sure, you're going to make this movie. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, he said, I was even getting embarrassed coming to Gettysburg yeah. because yeah. <laughs> talking to all the, everybody because, you know, he, you know, I met him in 1989 at the Cannes Film Festival. And um, I had a little, it was funny because I had a, um, well, it wasn't a fight, but um, it was uh, an altercation with this uh, Brit at the Carlton uh, <laughs> Hotel. And uh, we were sitting out on an outdoor cafe on the main drag, and I was sitting with some friends, and this drunk uh, uh, British guy uh, sat on my car that I'd rented. It was a, you know, a brand new Porsche, and rented it in Cannes. Uh -huh. And I just politely, I was sitting at the fence line, you know, the table was up against the fence. And I said, excuse me, sir, could you not sit on the hood? I'm, I don't want to take the car back, it's a rental, but I don't want to take it back. And I was eating a salad, and he walked over, and I'd had a few drinks, and he walked over to me, and he goes, Yo, bloody American, look at you. You don't even know how to eat a salad. Because I was just using a fork instead of the fork and the knife. Oh, you know? yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just, I don't know, I just grabbed him by the shirt, and I pulled him over the fence, over the table, you know, and right. I said a few nice words to him. And, and I threw him back over on the sidewalk, you know, back... The divider was the fence between us and the table, the table and the and him, and um, so everybody calmed down and you know we were laughing about it. He went on and and uh, these two guys were laughing, just laughing their butts off, you know. And and I looked over there and uh, it was these two men. One was Ron Maxwell, and he said, "Come here, come here, you know, <laughs> I got to talk to you." And so I walked over and sat down. He goes, "Are you an actor?" And I said. <laughs> Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I am. And he goes, wow. He goes, you know, you remind me. I, I, I directed Dennis Quaid in a movie called The Nights, The Lights Went Out in Georgia. And I said, yeah, I remember that film. Uh, and he says, yeah, you look just like him. And I said, well, he's my cousin. <laughs> I said, and he's like, no way and all this. And so he said, uh, I'm going to get you a script. I want, I want you to be in my film. And I said, great, you know. And so I met him. Later on, uh, the the next day, and we we ended up walking around and, uh, the town until two, three o'clock in the morning, just talking about stuff. And we hit a couple of bars. And as it turned out, he lived in New York City, and I lived not far from him in New York City. Uh -huh. So when we got back to New York, we started going to ball games and stuff. And um, um, you know, it, he was pushing that script in '89 to try to get it done with. I mean, um, nobody wanted to make a Civil War movie. And uh, he had some bites on it over the next couple of years, um, but nothing. And then he went to a round table um, up here that Ted Turner was at. And um, Do you know which one? Was it Harrisburg, Gettysburg? I don't remember which one it was, but um, who's the, the guy that the documentary, it's on the tip of my Ken tongue. Ken Burns? Ken Burns was there, and he had met Ken Burns before. So Ken Burns introduced him, if I'm not mistaken, to Ted Turner. Oh, okay. And they started talking. And I remember he called me and goes, we're getting it made. And I'm like, what? He's like, Ted Turner's going to make this film. Wow. And, uh, and so, you know, the rest was history. And Ken Burns is going to get a cameo as Hancock's uh, aide or valet oh, yeah, that's or whatever. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, so you, you were one of the early, well, I guess you weren't signed on, but you yeah, were one of the early, what, what do you call probably it? Probably one of the first. One of the first. Yeah. 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 So how can you be like, Hey, why don't you give me like a bigger, well, like, actually make me in, the Robert script, e. Lee. in the script, Walter Taylor's role was a lot bigger. Oh, that's right. It was a lot bigger. So what happened? They, they just, uh, oh, for gosh. time they had to cut it or it was, you know, the, I think the original director's cut was like six hours long uh, it was long the original director's cut yeah uh, yeah because yeah. the current director's cuts like what four and a half yeah something like something that, like that. Yeah. so you mean there's more yeah wow it was it was really long and maybe it was the rough cut okay. not the director's ah. cut but um i they had to cut a lot of scenes because you know we filmed more of the south than we did 
the North as well. Yeah. A lot more. Yeah. And so, you know, that happens. You get, you know, uh, you get on the cutting room floor all the sure. time. I was in secondhand lions and I had a good role and they decided to rewrite it and I got completely cut out uh. of it. And I took my son to the premiere. You know, uh, it was a big, you know, Warner Brothers film. And oh, because you don't even know until the premiere? They, my agent never told me. And, oh. and I get there and I'm sitting there and my son, Dakota, kept going, <laughs> Dad, when are you in it? I'm like, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> sad. I just so, would have pointed to someone you didn't know and say, well, that's me. They just have a lot of makeup on. <laughs> so, Matt, that, that was not a good hole to go down because now I want to ask what was missing oh gosh oh, it's been no, 28 please, years I don't I know. I'm going to just try one because as I'm giving tours of the battlefield I'm talking about the epic contest between the 15th Alabama Regiment and the 20th Maine because ever since Killer Angels and then the movie mm -hmm. that's what people want to hear about did you hear that Tim Smith anyway <laughs> I'm fellow guy anyway <clears throat> and people will often ask what do I think of the movie and I was skeptical I was here for the premiere the Gettysburg premiere Ron Maxwell was here oh 2018 Oh, no. No, the original. Yeah, the original. Oh, yeah. awesome. <laughs> I've been doing this too long. <laughs> Remember VHS Bob here with the gray hair? Right. Anyway. He had brown hair then. I, um, I can remember the intermission and wondering, since I was new, what would my fellow guides and park rangers be saying about this? And in my heart, I thought, I'm kind of liking this because I really like Killer Angels, too. And one of the things I liked the most was just before intermission, the bayonet charge of the 20th Maine. There's a scene where a Confederate prisoner asks, do you have any water? And I tell people on my tours that in the movie, they don't tell you why that question was there. But I give them some backstory the, the men have marched 25 miles that day. Their canteens have been captured and they've been fighting without water. Yeah. Do you know, was there such a scene in the movie that might have been cut where they explained that? It's a good question, Bob. No, to my recollection, there was not. Okay. Is that in the book? It's I in the, don't it's know. It's in the novel, isn't it? It is in the novel? I don't remember. I don't it's remember so, either. I've read the novel a number of times, but it's, I'm old, and it's been too long since I've read it. Because... I feel like if, if, they were to, if he was to put that in the novel, he would have had to make a character out of Colonel Oates. Like he did with everybody, and then right. tell the story, you know. Right. But okay. yeah, that's I don't a remember great that. question. Six and a half hours or so, you, you said, wow, that's, I'd yeah. love to see. There's no way a person could see that, isn't <laughs> no, it? No, uh, I mean, it, it was arduous mm. to, you know, seriously. You it's know. a big story to tell, though. It's a big story to tell. It and is a very big is, story is, to tell. You know, I know there's the lovers of Civil War that love it they would sit through a six hour movie but not your general public and that's no. what they were trying to achieve and there was a balancing act because you know Ron fought tooth and nail for every minute he could get on screen from his, for his film yeah. and you know what happens is and this is this is what happens it's you get the director's cut and then you get the producer's cut and it's usually the producer's cut is what you see mm -hmm. it's never the director's cut that's why you always see you know like oh this is the director's cut right you know, but I always buy those. If I have a choice between sure. the two, I always get that one. Yeah. Because I just think that you're getting the real movie there. Uh, well, you know, you do and you don't. Okay. Uh, you know, um, I had a long talk with Shane Black about this, the director of, he he wrote, um, uh, was, was this the guy you were talking about the other day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, <laughs> when he was no. like 20 years old, he wrote uh, yeah. a Lethal Weapon. Oh, Lethal Weapon, that's right. He yeah. wrote the Lethal Weapon movies and the last Boy Scout and, and, you know, last action hero, all this mm -hmm. stuff. And um, he was battling with his producer on the nice guys because he wanted something in there that he felt really, really strongly about. And, and the producer absolutely wouldn't let him do it. And um, finally, he, he said, well, you know, he's really good with his edits, right? Uh -huh. And seeing the movie... And seeing the scene that was in that movie, he 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 was too close to it. Right. Yeah. It, okay. It wouldn't have made any difference. It would have made it another minute longer, but it would also slowed it down, the pacing down. So a lot of times writer directors are so stuck on 
their words because they wrote them mm -hmm. and this and that that you know a, a, a good producer can come in and and say nope don't need that don't need that don't need that let's get this movie under you know a uh, uh, hundred minutes yeah or I got you hundred and twenty so minutes. they could look at it with a fresh set of eyes and yes it is I believe they call it killing your babies it's hard to kill your babies when you're a a writer, a creative person. You got to be willing as a writer director to throw away your darlings. Yes. Okay. That's a nicer way to yeah. say it. <laughs> and, and you know, I, did, I had to do it on Bay house. Yeah. Uh, I had this beautiful ending, uh, of these two guys sitting on the beach and we shot it, uh, with the sun coming up and we had this great fire at the, at the end, there's a fi there are fireworks and the whole family is standing on the banister of this Bay house and they're looking at these fireworks after this horrific weekend that they'd had. <laughs> And then I had the camera start moving down as the fireworks were going out. And then it bleeds into a rising sun and the camera keeps coming down and settles. And there's these two brothers sitting on the beach and they're watching the sun come up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted it in there so bad. My DP wanted it in there so bad. But it was like a rehash of everything. It was like... A rehash okay. of, of the whole movie, and if we do, so I, you ended it with the fireworks because there's nothing else to say after that, right? Yeah, yeah. So as much as I hated to cut it, I cut it. Yeah. So there's directors that can't let go, and there's those that can. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing, no matter how beautiful. You have to really be willing to throw away your darlings to make the story have uh, impact and also pacing. Now, when when you got to start shooting Gettysburg. Right. It's 1992. Uh, you come up here. You're going to be Robert E. Lee's, uh, what was he, Bob? Chief of Staff or was he his aide or what, what was his title? I don't think Chief of Staff. I don't no, think so no, either. No, It was... Um, uh, adjutant? Like adjutant, yeah. Adjutant, okay. Um, so he's, you're going to be Lee's... So that means now you're going to be acting uh, alongside mostly with Martin Sheen. Had you met Martin Sheen before? I knew him. Before. You knew him before. Yeah. So I've been to it, dinner with him. I knew him. And my ex-wife. Because ex of this project or from? No. Uh, uh, okay. Well, my, my ex-wife did a movie of the week with him 10 years before. We're talking Melissa Gilbert? Yeah. Okay. And uh, they'd worked together and stayed in touch. So um, he'd come to New York a couple of times. We went out and saw, he did this, he did a play uh, of Shakespeare in the park, uh, and you know we went and saw the show and went out to dinner afterwards and I knew him and really admired him he was a, just a sweet sweet man he really is mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I really I just enjoyed working with him so much um, but so you weren't nervous then working not alongside at all. him because you knew him no okay so that's not at all that's good so it's now it's you're getting in here what? Go ahead. What were well, you? Because I wasn't nervous. I've never been nervous working with anybody like okay. Duvall or anybody. Because so you weren't you nervous about work, coming here and talking to me? Yeah, I was nervous. Okay. For you? I'm, yes, I'm still right. Okay. No, but um, <laughs> you know, if you if you come prepared and you do your work, then that gives you the confidence to be around the big boys, okay. right? Okay. So I started researching way before the film ever started, and. Um, you know, gosh, I was off book, you know, way before we, you know, way before we started shooting, I, I you know, off book means you so, had the script memorized. Yeah. Is that what that means? Yeah, okay. pretty much. I mean, not memorized, but I just learned the lines. I, I just, I really had, a, a, I felt like I really knew the character. I felt real confident with, with who Walter Taylor was. So, um, yeah, no, I wasn't nervous at all. I, I was excited. You know, I, we were talking one day after, uh, you know, we'd worked together for about a month and uh, he was talking about his career and stuff. And I said, yeah, I saw, I think the first thing you ever did. And I said, actually, I've been following your career since I was a little kid. And he goes, no, really? And I'm like, yes. I said, the reason is because you were always baby faced. You were this young, much younger than what you were. And I said, that's been my affliction. I've always looked so much younger than my age. And I've had to, you know, audition for, you know, 15 and 16 year old roles when I'm 21 and 22. And, you know, yeah. 22 year olds don't think like 
you know, 15 year olds, right? They don't have that spontaneity that a 15 year old would or, or the body, uh, uh, not even the, uh, um, the baby face, like they don't look, well, they don't look it. They don't but, even but move. Most, uh, they don't even move like it. You know, like they're just. Oh, that's true. Teenagers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. a little more confident, I guess. Is they're just different. They're, you know. But don't they do that? Isn't that what they do in Hollywood though? Where like, where if it's a show about high school kids, they're usually people in their twenties or late yeah, they teens. Are, at least. Yeah, like yeah. early twenties. Yeah, know? yeah. But I don't know. I just uh, was I was afflicted with looking really, really young. You know, and it, it bugged me that I didn't want to read for sixteen-year-old roles. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted to read for you know, and I didn't look that age. But anyway, we talked about that, and he had the same problem. And and he goes, and I said, Yeah, I remember the first thing you ever did. And and he said, You, I guarantee you don't know. And I said, You played, you were on my three sons for one episode, <laughs> and you played an Air Force pilot who had to eject from his his plane, and you lost your helmet. And one of the three sons found it and gave it to you. And you were on the show for like just a minute or two yeah, of screen time. And he goes, wow, I can't believe that. I'm like, hope I'm not creeping you out or anything. He's like, no, no, no. You know. <laughs> oh, my God. My three sons. I got to go try to find that now. You, do Who's you the guy feel that... afflicted? No. I'm, yeah. I'm I was going to say, we're the same age. I'm okay. a couple months older than you. Okay. Um, we don't... I don't really know if we want to give private information. Oh, away. I don't care. Yeah, I just 48. turned 64 last week. Last week, right? Yes. Just, yeah. So, um, wait, but you, you turned, look a lot younger. Yeah, wait, I so thought you were that's in your not 50s. an affliction anymore. <laughs> no, now it's a gift. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, you're 64. 64. Oh, for some reason, I thought you were like 56. Not alive when Albert Wilson was alive. Oh, he between just, my he just birth in it. June and your birth in September, the last Civil War soldier died. Oh, I thought it was fifty-seven. The last soldier died. Well, Albert, well, he's from the South. Okay, <laughs> 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 we don't believe the documentation for those Confederates who say they were in the Civil War, but right. the last Union soldier <laughs> there, died. There you go. Okay, there okay. you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> you know, when my father was, uh, you know, used to tell me when he was a kid, he knew a lot of Civil War veterans. You know, he was born in the 20s. Sure. Oh, same here. My you mom know. just died two years ago, and she had in her memory those Memorial Day parades you'd gone on where there were Civil War veterans yeah. all the time. That's how close history is Bro, to yeah. us. I don't know about you, but my great-grandfather fought in this war. I have his musket on my mantle. So it's just, two, just a couple generations removed for me. My mom was one of 13, and I'm the youngest of five, so most people are raised. It would be a great great grandfather. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but you're right. It's, yeah. it's recent. Yeah, it yeah. is. People don't realize that. Mm-hmm. So how how old were you when when you did the movie Gettysburg? Thirty five. Thirty five. Okay. Thirty five. Uh, yeah. Okay. You do. <laughs> I bet Taylor you was are, younger you than are that. You are baby face because I was thinking <laughs> watching it the other day. <laughs> That you were like in your twenties. <laughs> well, <laughs> so would, would right. not Major Taylor have been in his twenties? I don't know. I, I think should he would have been, but right? I don't know that. But so, yeah. so for that reason, that's that why was they good cast casting. Both. Yeah, that's why they cast him there. But from, from my three sons picking up his helmet to flapjacks <laughs> at Gettysburg. Well, do, do, do you have a favorite line that you remember yeah. or anything from the movie? Because everybody, Matt, everybody remembers that line. That's uh, like one of the famous lines from the whole yeah. movie. Like the whole movie. Well, yeah. I mean, that's probably would be the favorite because it was. You know, the rest well, of the stuff true. was, you know, I can do the work, sir, you know, and all that. Oh, but yeah, yeah. It, but yeah. I have some great, you know, I've got to dig these pictures up. Um, I, I have these I, pictures of uh, Lee sitting on his horse uh, right before we do a take. And I'm in the background with uh, my sword, uh, you know, running through in the back, you know. <laughs> and he's just sitting there. Just looking like, you know, huh, waiting for action. Uh, and I'm behind him going, ah, <laughs> oh, why didn't they make it in the movie? Oh, man. That would have been fun. That would have been good. I want to see the director's cut. <laughs> the blooper reel. Yes. Um, yeah, what do you do? So I've always wondered this because, you know, a lot of comedies, they'll put the blooper reel over the end credits. Yes. And I often find them to be a lot funnier than the movie. Yeah. A lot more funny. What, right. what am I trying to say? Yeah, yeah. we got yeah. it, man. Sorry, I'm having a stroke. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but blooper reels 
for a movie like Gettysburg. Yeah, it's un- usually you do blooper reels for comedies, mm-hmm. but not dramas and war movies. Well, I don't mean. Actually, I'm know. sorry. I don't mean actually like doing a blooper reel. I mean mess ups. When you mess yeah. up. Yeah, that's a blooper reel. No, 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 no. I know. Oh. But what I'm saying is when you mess up in a serious movie like Gettysburg. Yeah. Do people laugh? Or, oh or, or is it gosh, like, yes. do you have? Okay. Oh, we have so much. We had so much fun. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. You, you know, the scene where um, <clears throat> uh, Martin Sheen is on this little hill with a little tarp over him. And he gives me a message, and I walk down the hill to where the Tom Berenger and all the generals are looking at a map. Yes. And I say, uh, uh, General so and so, Lee wants to speak with you. Remember that line? Just one line. I'm yeah. like, uh, General Lee would like to have a word with you. Remember, <laughs> or something like that. Well, okay, so uh, Berenger was a big trickster, right? So. Mm-hmm. It was a big setup, too. And we're shooting 35. Okay. Okay. 35 it's millimeter. Yes. Film. Right. It's not like we're shooting HD or anything where you right. just, oh, well, let's do another take, right? right? 35 is expensive. It's a dollar a foot, you know? And so this setup was huge because it's on a, a Technocrane. It's way up high like this. And it sees, you know, it, it first shows me and, and Lee. Then it, the technocrane follows me down the hill. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then I go okay. under, and at the and just as I get towards the bottom of the hill, this wagon of artillery just roars by, you know, and there's troops going the other way. So it's a big setup, right? Six horse, uh, six horse wagon barreling through, and the troops, and, and they've timed it out. By the time I get to uh, Longstreet, uh, the wagons have passed, and and then the camera starts moving into us to mm-hmm. a, to like a two shot. So I get there, and Barringer's making makes funny eyes at me, and, and I'm like, I look at him, I go, General Lee would like to speak with you, and I hear Ron Maxwell go, come. <laughs> oh my god Bo what happened I said he's making faces at me <laughs> and so he goes oh guys come on man we gotta get this I'm like, so we reset the scenes and it took you know 15 minutes to reset it the horses have to be pulled back to the other uh, yeah. part the, the troops all have to be on the other side you know so we go again I go down go down we did a perfect shot the technocrane follows me we go into the shot and everybody else is off camera, and they're all making big faces. Like, uh, <laughs> and I just look at everybody, I'm like, um, uh, General Longstreet would like to speak with you. And Ron just falls, <laughs> literally falls out of his chair. Bo, oh, you're killing me. Oh my God. And everybody's and, laughing. And now everyone else wants to do it again. And yeah, again. right. So, <laughs> so the third time, did they still try to do it? That you... The third time, you know, I, I walked over, I go, Ron, I'm really sorry, but you know, they keep making faces at me. And he's like, okay, guys, we got to get it this time. All right, no, no mess around, you know. So the next time I came down, we did the shot and boom, it was, we were out. Uh, but, I'll never see, but <laughs> never see that again without thinking of this. And, and Ron was laughing too, you know, he, he thought it was funny. Yeah. But, but then, you know, Ron said, you know, that's like, you know, we're talking later. And he goes, man, that's, you know, about 20 grand, you know, to shoot <laughs> oh that thing, you know. Goodness. And I'm like, that much, you know. Wow. wow. You oh. know? Yeah. <laughs> and then Ted Turner was funny. During, uh, Gods and Generals, uh, we were burning about 650 a day, 650,000 a day. And uh, um, Turner, by this time, I, I knew him pretty well. So he was getting ready to do his scene. And I walked up to him. I go, Ted, whatever you do you know get your lines right and he goes he looks at me he goes why i go this scene right here 30 grand 30 grand if you mess up we're gonna have to do it all over again it's 30 grand every time every time you go up and he goes ron did you i, yeah. <laughs> I was like don't tell him that i'm like that, well, that's his 30 it's grand, his money, 30 grand. You know? yeah and, and he's like well, i didn't know that 30 are you serious and, it, and then ron said well it's not that much but it you know, it's expensive, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. It was pretty funny. Now, you so guys, we had a lot of fun on the film. If I remember right, um, <clears throat> it was the Slider House. I don't know if that name's going to mean anything to you. It does. That they were depicting as Lee's headquarters. Yeah. The building we're 
in right now, of course, looked very different, and it wasn't owned by the American Battlefield Trust. Right. So uh, in a similar house, a stone house. Slider sounds familiar to you? Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm pretty I sure that's that what they filmed Lee's headquarters. It was, yeah. Headquarters. What, that's what, that's it was. Me, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Beautifully lit. That mm-hmm. was gorgeous. The, yeah. It looks a lot different today. There's no trees around it. My, my nephew was a, 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 a drummer boy, and he was a, oh, he's in that really? scene. Oh, yeah. really? Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. That must be so super. So, yeah, so so super. Well, I'm <laughs> it was sorry. Cool. No, it's really cool to bring, you know, pull your family <laughs> so, in. Sure. Yeah, yeah, my of my son was in uh, Drummer Boy and Guys and Generals, and my uh, nephew was, you know, <clears throat> 10 did, years apart in the does, film. Does your son, how many kids do you have? Uh, I have uh, two. Two. Do they act or are they in the business at all? Or My son wants nothing to do with that. He grew up in a green room. He grew up, you know, in a green room of a of theater and uh-huh. on a set between his mother and I, he was back and forth Constant, a lot yeah. on, on movie sets and he just, you know, he didn't want to have anything to do so with it. So what does he do? Um, pretty much what you're doing. Oh, does he really? <laughs> just sits yeah. around and he's a loaf. people? And- <laughs> he's a loaf. <laughs> uh, he's got a blog and I mean, he does, um, he does, uh, uh, he does games in Austin. He's like a game shop. Um, like a, a, not video games, but like oh, magic like, card oh, games yeah, 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 and yeah. all that stuff. It's really big, big business. Like for Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons and all that stuff. Uh, the card games, yeah, yeah. Um, I forget which. But there's a there's a shop in town here that uh, yeah does there, that. There's yeah. They have nerd. nerd Actually, stuff. there's two. There's one yeah. place called the Nerd Herd. Oh, I've and seen then it. There's yeah. An, yeah, and then there's another place. I forget its name. I feel bad because I just brought it up, but I forget the name. But anyway, they they hold host games and stuff like that. And hey, man, I guess it beats doing heroin. You know, like, <laughs> it could be worse. He, that's I mean, he uh, it brings him happiness and it's lucrative. So he digs yeah. it. You know, oh yeah, he and people, his wife and people and, uh, spend uh, money on games. He's a total nerd, though. Well, good. <laughs> when your good. grandmother calls you a nerd, you know you're a nerd, <laughs> right? As my mother said, I love him to death. He's a nerd, but I love him to death. <laughs> Well, let's get to some questions that our audience sent in here, Bo. Um, they're very thrilled to be able to ask you something. And uh, we're going to start here with, hmm, let's see. Oh, how about Matthew McClanahan? He says, Matt, good get. I've always enjoyed his portrayal. And he says, this is his question. Or these are his questions, I should say. Your portrayal of Taylor conveyed an almost father-son relationship between General Lee and Major Taylor. It was evident that even in his post-war writings, Taylor was still protective of Lee and his legacy. As an actor, how do you utilize historical documents to portray a real-life person? And what do you allow for your own artistic expression? What did you learn about Taylor that surprised you? Uh, when I started doing the research, I was shocked at how his life after after the war was. You know, I mean, he had such an incredible life. Um, he was such an incredible citizen um, uh, to his community. Um, he went back into the law business. He was uh, Texas. I mean, the railroad commissioner, I believe. He he was a lawyer for the uh, railroad and. And I think in his later years, he was actually involved in the highway, um, in the in the Virginia highway. And I just vaguely remember Sounds something familiar. about uh, he was in he was uh, you know involved in the plannings of of highway uh, um, in Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't tr- I wanted to be really true to to this character, and um, you know he was a he was a numbers guy, right? I mean, he kept, that's why we have all the great information that we do today about the Civil War. Uh, casualties, wounded, uh, where the troops were. Uh, you know, he kept terrific records, mm-hmm. better than anyone else on either side, really. Um, so he would be, I remember thinking he would be a f- fastidious, you know, and, and, and he wanted to fight so badly, but uh, Lee couldn't afford to lose him and wouldn't let him, but, you know, he a few times during he did you know take up Sneak a musket in there. Yeah. you know and and much to you know Lee his disliking you know but uh, he was just wanted to get in the fight so badly and he was never able to really fight right because he was you know Lee didn't want to lose him you know Lee depended on him sure 
Um, they had an incredible father and son relationship. And, you know, that famous photograph of Lee, you know, and, and his son after the war when they went back to, you know, that the, we sitting in the chair and mm-hmm. um, Walter Taylor's on one side and Lee's son is on the other. Mm. I mean, they were close. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Richard Dreyfus, I got a note from him once that he, uh, he was, a, I didn't realize he was such a huge Civil War Big fan. Big history book, yeah. And he said that uh, my depiction of, of Lee, of uh, Walter Taylor, was right on the money. He said, oh, wow. he, he, you know, everything. That was my biggest. That's I was like, like, that's wow. like, that's you like know. double layer nerd in there because it's a great actor telling you, you did a great job, Yeah, <clears throat> but he also knows history enough to know how great a job you did. Yeah. So it's acting great job and history, great job overlapping there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I was blown away. Yeah. Um, I didn't even know he was a civil war buff, but and he's such an incredible actor. So it just what you said, yeah. it was, yeah. it was really cool. So I, I didn't bring any artistic uh, anything to it, really. I just really did follow him as the, to the best of my ability to serve his character of the man that he was. There's, I forget which shot it is, um, but you're kind of off in the background. Lee's talking to Longstreet, I think, and you're off in the background. You got your arm resting on your on your sword and you're, you know, smoking, smoking a, cigar. a cigar and everything. Like, and just, just kind of looking like you're posing for a photo. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but yeah, that's that, kind of that was w- a little the actor that came out in me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it's still, I mean, it kind of looks like he, the way you portray him, that looks like a fitting stance for him when he's just kind of waiting for something to do. Well, yeah, no, you know? yeah, he was always at attention, like, you know, he yeah. was fastidious. He was a numbers guy, you know, yeah. he was, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I didn't use any, I, I just really wanted to be so true to the, the, the actual character. Are you a fastidious him. guy? No. So how do you play a fastidious guy? If you're not, if it, because I'm not. And so, yeah. I mean, I'm not an actor either, but like, I can't imagine what that person thinks. Like, how do you get into that head? Yeah. I, you know, we're talking 28 years ago, but, um, I, uh, I, you know, I just imagined what it would be. What, what somebody so like, just like be. be the opposite They're, of yourself. And then right. the, yeah. I mean, the way they would stand, mm-hmm. the way they would walk, the way they would think. Um, and putting and, that uniform helps kind of, doesn't and it? Putting the uniform on really, yeah. really helps, you know, uh, it does. Yeah. yeah cause it, it, it's, you kind of, you're not yourself because you can't be, cause you're not moving in the same type of clothing you're used to. That's and, true. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny about that. Um, actresses generally speaking, uh, work from the outside in where they are first, uh, they really find their character by wearing the costume. Huh. Men work the opposite. They work from the inside out. Interesting. So they, they internalize the character more, you know, and then um, it's more completed when they are finally, uh, you know, in costume. But uh, I've noticed huh. that about actors and actresses and over the years in theater and in film with, with women That's and weird. with men. That's weird. Yeah. Because outside of acting, men are the shallow ones. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Alienate your, office, your audience. <laughs> say, let, before you say anything more, let me jump in with a go couple ahead. things here. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I couldn't help, as you were talking about that, Bo, to think about the similarities between Alexander Hamilton and George Washington and Walter Taylor and Robert E. Lee. Do you have any hip hop in you? Because there could be a great hip hop Broadway. <laughs> Taylor. Taylor. <laughs> no. Huh? Well, you you do write and produce and all that stuff. No, huh? Okay. That would, but, that'll be a hit. Yeah. But uh, Rich, Richard Dreyfus, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, Matt, or or you, Eric. Let me know if you do remember. But the Cyclorama, when I first came here as a guide, I think it had a different. Um, soundtrack, if that's the right word. Oh, and he today, of course, it, it's it? very different. But for a number of years, maybe while you were doing this, Richard Dreyfus was the voice. I'll be darned. Of the Cyclorama. I wow. think I, uh, I think I do. The narrator. I did not know that, but I do remember going to see it in the old Cyclorama Center. Yes. And thinking the voice sounded familiar, but yeah, I don't think I knew who it was. And the last line was something like, uh, he's quoting an officer in Pickett's division, we gained nothing. We gained nothing but glory and lost our bravest men. Oh. I wish I could do it like Richard Dreyfuss. Yeah, don't we all? Say. 
Please note, though, that I was only eight years old the year the movie came out, so uh, oh. I really don't remember oh, that my, at all. You guys are <laughs> young. Oh, you youngins. I, uh, yeah. I wasn't much older than that. I was only 10 You're years old. still not much older than that, now, Matt. What was the rest of the question? There were two, was it two, two part there, questions? No, I think you got it. Uh, as an actor, how do you utilize historical documents to portray, uh, well, you kind of touched on that. So yeah, what, what, what historical documents, research. I got, I bought the book for my four years with Lee. Okay. I read it back to back. All right. Yeah. And, um, and I'm assuming you read the Killer Angels too. Yes. So, because... Yeah, and this is something that I hear a lot of people say about it's this is an interesting little community, the Civil War community. It is. When it comes to movies, it's like there's some people that are just so unforgiving of inaccuracies with uniforms right. or whatever it may be. And uh, in fact, one of one of our followers sent me um, I won't say the name of the movie, but he sent me a, a movie and he said you know, this is really good because the guys they got to be the, you know, extras, the reenactors are really good with their uniforms and like everything is accurate. And I, I watched, I watched it and I go, and it's the most boring movie I ever watched in my life. What movie? I don't want to say it. I'll tell you later, but okay. I don't want to say it. But, um, it was just, I didn't care about the characters. It was full of sappiness. It was cliche out the yin yang. Oh, North and South. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> North and South. No, no, that's horrible too. But I love that though. I love it because I have a yeah. memory of being a kid oh, on yeah. my grandparents' floor. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I love that. It was, show. it was a great, yeah, the horrible Civil War, but great. Yeah. TV, um, but anyway. So, uh, what was I? What were we well, talking about? about? The uniforms. Well, they're oh, too the, clean. The uniform. Right? Well, the, they're they're too clean. Um, no, but that's not where I was you going. Know, I think you were trying to make a correlation between the accuracy of uniforms versus no. I got how it. How good of a movie it is. Okay. So one of the things I, I hear people say a lot is, you know, they criticize Martin Sheen's Lee, and uh, you know they say, well, Lee wasn't this like out of it old man and everything like that. He was that. ill at the time. And then, and this and but not only that, but that's what Shara portrays him as is this kind of tired, worried, ill old man. Mm -hmm. And um so when you take that into account and from what I remember uh, Sheen wasn't supposed to be Lee from the gecko was Duval. Mm -hmm. And then is that right? And then there was uh, something happened with Duvall, he couldn't do it, and then like Sheen had like no time to prepare. Okay, so is that right? As I recall, um, Duvall was in the it was in the Duvall was in the works a little bit, and then believe it or not, Sam Elliott as Lee. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. And I I pitched a fit. I was like, you know, I mean, by this time. Uh, Ron and I had both moved to Los Angeles mm -hmm. and he knew uh, uh, he moved into my neighborhood. So he's right down the street. So I saw him every day. We had coffee. We, you know, and, and I was just like, no way. I said, I love Sam Elliott, but do not make this mistake. This is a terrible mistake. Yeah. It will kill the movie. Yeah. Uh, because it just. And he goes, oh, but you don't understand, you know, Sam Elliott, you know, Lee was, you know, tall and, you know, he's not the person that you think and all this. And I'm like, no, I mean, I, he's got this Texas draw. I said that it'd be a big mistake. And I was actually, and I don't care. I was a little disappointed. As much as I love Sam Elliott, I was a little disappointed that he would actually play that role. Yeah, I think he was perfect where he I was. Mean, I was. I was a little disappointed that he would even want to. Oh, oh, and he did? So this wasn't just Ron Maxwell saying, I think I might want oh, to no, use no, him. No, no, TNT wanted him. Oh, as Lee. Yeah. Ooh. And I was like, big mistake. And so, you know, Ron is just, uh, he's such a great salesman, you know, he, you know, so, uh, and, and I don't, Lee, I mean, Ron wasn't sold on that deal either, you know. And so he went and talked to um, uh, Sam Elliott and Sam got the perfect role. I mean, yeah. that was a yeah. great role for him. Oh my God. You know? Yeah. Uh, and then, um, the subject of, of, uh, Martin Sheen came and I, I just thought, wow, that's, a, and I loved, I always liked him anyway. Yeah, so I yeah. was like, Oh my gosh, that would be fantastic. You know? I mean, I, I just knew that he could nail it. And, um, you know, I, I think he did a good job, but I think that he was really, you know, 
he was kind of stuck to the novel more, you know, where, right. you know, Lee was, uh, cause a lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people didn't like his portrayal because they thought that he was kind of like, kind of aloof, c- aloof like- and, you know, and, and just, you know, he but, was like, he was high all day. Right. Was I, some around, some like, people said that, you know, like he was just kind of like, uh, but, but Lee was, was playing Lee at the, at the time was not in the greatest of health. Right. So he was making, you know, some poor decisions and he wasn't clear on things sometimes. You know, he, you know, he was fallible. He was a great he's man. A human being, yeah. But he's human and he was, he was tired and he was, I don't know what was wrong with him, but he was, um, he had, uh, well, he had diarrhea and uh, I think they think right. it was starting angina or and, early stages of angina. Yeah, there's been some doctors in the last few years who have been writing <laughs> articles thinking he was beginning to suffer the heart disease pains that would take right. his life in another, what, seven in years. five years, seven yeah. years later. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, I think that, uh, that, that's a fine line. That's a real tough role, uh, to, to, f- Tough boots to, to fill, yeah. right? But then when, when you have to play the character and at the same time uh, trying to show your men that you're still strong and that and that, that the meantime you're sick, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that, that, was, that was tough. It's that exhausting. Was a, it was an exhausting time, and I think Marty pulled that off, but I know a lot of people felt like he was like kind of too in and out or not, not you know. I think the problem up. is because the movie is called Gettysburg, so they think they're getting a history when really it's just the movie version oh, big of a, it's the, the, the Killer Angels version of yeah. it. You know, yeah. it, you know, it wasn't historically correct in in a lot of ways and in some areas. So you know, it's a movie. You know? <laughs> right. That's uh, what I keep telling people. Remember, it's a yeah, movie, right. Hollywood production based on a novel. Yes. But as that, it's good. It's good. Absolutely. Yeah. It right. was very good. And, and like I said to that listener last night, I said you can you can have great uniforms or you can have a great movie, but you can't have them both. Because something's going to suffer if you focus too much right. on the other thing. Hey, Bo, did you get to work much with uh, Jeff Daniels or any of those union officers, or is it mostly just with the Confederates? Mostly with just the Confederates, mm-hmm. but I hung out with Jeff a little bit. Oh, yeah. did you? Okay. Yeah, so I got to know him pretty well. Do you still? I knew we used to call each other now and then, and I haven't talked to him in a long time. But, okay. But, you know, I mean, like my last time to Gettysburg before uh, 2018, it, Jeff and I, came out and uh you know hit oh. the battlefields together when oh. we were doing gods and generals so that was yeah. uh 2020 i mean yeah 20 uh 2001 yeah. yeah okay so um, so that was a lot, so then that that was a long time until your next visit yeah i haven't i haven't seen him in, in a long time no but i mean, i've saying, talked to him on the phone a couple of times in the past but you know it was a long time just for you to come and visit Gettysburg. Yeah. Uh, 17 years. Amazing. And, you know, then I came back for the reunion in 2018. You know how when, when people like us have any kind of point of contact with people like you, we, <laughs> we just think that makes us, you know, somehow get some of that glory. So I, I was giving a tour of Little Round Top. I think it was 1992. Which, <coughs> 92, you guys were filming, yes. I think, right? I was giving a tour of Little Round Top. And I got back to the old visitor center, and one of my fellow guides said, did you see that Jeff Daniels was listening into your tour at Little Round Top? Oh, wow. And I was dumb and dumber. I didn't know who (laughs) Jeff Daniels was until the movie came out. So if you ever see Jeff, tell him I'm the guy. (laughs) Yeah, as if he would remember that. A a funny story about Jeff Daniels. When he was was up for, uh, to play the role of... of, um, no, uh, Chamberlain. Chamberlain. Yeah. Sorry, I had a brain fart. Um, I was like, I begged Ron not to hire him. Oh, really? I thought he would do a terrible job. I said he's a comedian. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I, oh my gosh! And I, you know, I haven't read the script twenty times. I'm like, really? And he goes, I know. And he was like, I'm, you know, TNT was really pushing for him and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know. And so Ron flew up to Michigan and auditioned him read him and he came back and I said, well, what, what, what did you decide? And he just looked at me and he said, Bo, he's Chamberlain. I said, really? He goes, oh man, you know, and I'd forgotten that, you know, Jeff Daniels is a 
I saw him on Broadway right. in yeah. 1980, you know, uh, uh, in a, a Lanford Wilson play. The guy is just a, such a terrific actor. And yeah. He is really, he can do anything. He can do comedy, drama, you name it. And I think he nailed uh, Chamberlain. He was just right on. Oh, right. I think it's like one of his best roles. Oh, yeah. he pales to you in this. <laughs> when you did Gods and Generals, you still looked like you were younger. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> I lost 20 pounds for that role. <laughs> there's a... <laughs> There's a meme that's going around of us. It's a shot from the little round top scene with Jeff Daniels and he's pointing down the hill and the way he's pointing, you know, is very much like the way guides point on the battlefield. And the meme says something to the effect of, uh, you know, to study for his role as Jeff Dan or as uh, Joshua Chamberlain, Jeff Daniels studied licensed battlefield guides or something to that effect. And now you're telling us this story that you, you maybe he did. So someone does that as a joke, but he actually I was, was watching I was about, your tour. I was about Chamberlain's age when I was giving that tour wow. too. So. All right, that's Eric leaving there. All right, let's move along. Let's, let's move we got more questions here. Uh, Michael Lentz wants to know, do you like flapjacks? Yes. Okay. Um, in all seriousness, he says, what are your memories of how the Gettysburg community reacted to the filming of the movie? Oh, what was boy. it like? Because I have met oh, a lot of man. people who have plenty of stories about... Well, that's something she can answer. <laughs> Chris. Uh, Chris, would you like to grab a microphone and answer that? Would you like to answer? Go ahead, grab it. I don't think Gettysburg knew what hit it. I don't think anybody uh, had a vision of what it would do for the community. Um, if anything, it awakened a passion for the, just the citizens of Gettysburg to come together. And actually, if nothing else in my lifetime, I'm 55, I've never seen anything that brought American history to the eyes of the community. And so in that respect, I think it was amazing. What did you, what were you doing here at the time? I am born and raised here. No, but I mean, for work, why, like, were you interacting with them in, through work or, or what, what stories do you remember? Well, in the community, we would, um, I thought it was funny for me personally. Um, I'm a business owner, so I own a hair salon. Okay. My uh, just friends were saying, this movie's coming to town. Um, and we just started going out to dinner. We would go out to dinner, go to the restaurants, because you couldn't go where they were filming, right? Right. You would get a girlfriend, and you'd walk the battlefields to see what you could see, uh -huh. right? And so, and if not, then you would go get a drink at a bar in case you would run into somebody. And at that point in time, I didn't know anybody. I'm like, I don't know anybody's name. I, I had two small kids. I didn't know who anybody was. But my friends were literally the ones saying, let's go out. We're going out tomorrow night. We're going out tonight. And that's how I met Bo, actually. Um, oh, okay. Met him So here. you guys have known each other all that time. Yeah. For, oh, cool. Yeah, we've known each other for, whatever, 28 years now. So anyhow, so on that note, from my experience was you just went to see what you could find. Um, you wanted right. to be a part of the excitement. It was, we just talked about this last night at dinner. It was the most exciting time as a Gettysburgian. Since that the battle. I, I just, you just didn't <laughs> see it coming. You know what I mean? You didn't see it coming. Yeah. Honestly, you didn't know what to expect. It was phenomenal. There, it I brought mean, a zeal to the town. I talk, I've talked to people who worked at the Farnsworth house, um, which is where you guys were, you know, holding court and everything. And uh, they, they guys just have some great stories about, uh, well, I won't say, because <laughs> it was, you know, private uh, partying, but uh, just great stories to, to hear and, and imagine. And um, yeah, I wish I was around at that time because that would have been fun. I would have eaten all that up. Of course, I was like 12. Of course, that with the Ken Burns documentary and the movie Glory all coming out about the same time. Yeah, yeah. And economically, it really helped. Got everybody area. back in the Civil War. my perspective as a tour guide. That's, I was just becoming a guide, and wow, did we have some business. Yeah. When I first got to Gettysburg, I had just finished a play in Cincinnati, and uh, I closed the play that night and came. I, was, I did the first scene, uh, the, the first scene in Gettysburg, the, the first day of shooting. And uh, so, I mean, I got I got into Gettysburg at like three in the morning and I, I was in makeup at five and at six I was on set and you know, a couple of hours sleep. Yeah. Oh, the flak jack. The, uh, the, the flak jack. That was the first yeah. scene in the film shot. 
So you were working on, you're running on empty at that point. Running on empty, yeah. <laughs> How long of so, a day was that? Do you remember? Oh gosh, it was a 12 hour it day. It was a 12 hour day. Oh, absolutely. Just doing that but, scene over and over again for 12 hours? Well, that and the other scenes that go okay. around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. But uh, I, I, you know, immediately started going out into the town and, oh man, uh, I remember a lot of the shop owners and the restaurant people going, oh, it's so dead here. You know, they're complaining about, mm -hmm. no, the tourists had dropped off so badly by 1992. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I went back a, two years later and I'm not kidding you. I couldn't buy a beer anywhere. They're no, like, yeah. your money's no good here. Yeah. You know, because there was just this resurgence of people interested in the civil war. And if, if, I mean, I, that's what makes me feel good. You sure. know, that the movie was as, as successful as it was, and it, it really did start a new interest in our history as a country. And yeah. then ben, uh, Gettysburg benefited from it for a, quite a long time. I mean, Chris says up to 10 years, you know, it, it really did uh, benefit. And now it's starting to drop off again. Mm hmm yeah, I had a young couple from North Carolina who I think hired me five years in a row to do a tour and they could almost quote word for word every <laughs> word of the script wow. and they would pretend they were you guys. Oh, and so wow. they were so into it because of that. <laughs> yeah. And a little bit long lasting, there used to be telephone lines lining the Emmitsburg Road. Yeah. And I believe Ted Turner paid to have those taken down. And so still a lasting I impact. think that was the deal with the park. Like, let us shoot some stuff yeah. on the actual ground and we'll yes. put your uh, right. telephone lines on Because they didn't want that there either. Yeah. Right. And, and we also had to camouflage a lot of the statues. <clears throat> oh, oh, yeah. I remember. Well, there's, there's, we a, there's a, a debris and stuff. Yeah. On, the, on little rounds. It's supposed to be big round top. Right. But it's actually Little Round Top, and you can see the Warren statue behind Jeff Daniels and C. Thomas Howell <laughs> <laughs> as they're pretending to look down from the top of Big Round Top. They just, it looks like they just threw some branches over the Warren statue, and you're like, wait a second, because the wind will blow, and then you'll see the outline of the statue only, there. You know, well, uh, that was the 44th know. New York. General public. The never. 44th New York and the 91st Pennsylvania, they put scaffolding up and put... Those, that's the big castle-like monument yes. and the other big monument at the very yeah. peak. Warren, my memory was they did not cover that that year, but instead they used camera angles. I don't can't oh, remember the... Oh, it was a bush that was growing there? N n n or like a tree that was growing? I don't know. It We're going to have to look at this. You're going to have to show yeah. me what you see. Okay. Wow. Because I remember I, I, I was a teacher for most of my life, too. Yeah. I, at this point, I was teaching eighth graders, and I was showing the movie Gettysburg, and I hit pause at one point just to explain to the kids that's General Warren, the actor. I can't remember his name. Who was General Warren? Do you guys remember? Duh. Anyway, and I said, there's, there's a big statue of him right behind him, but you can't see the statue because of the camera angles. And one of my kids said, well, what's that coming out of his navel? Oh. And sure enough, you could see just the, like the field glasses of the statue of Warren oh. coming out of the actor. <laughs> so we'll have to look at it again. Oh, okay. right. Right. You have to hit pause at just the right Because the general oh, Warren it. shot is just, it's a quick shot. Right. Like there's no dialogue, nothing. It's just right. this it's one just little shot insert. Of it, but yeah. the statue's behind it. And you know, you know how memory plays tricks with you, but I'm yes. pretty sure, Matt, I remember that year giving Was tours. that Lazenby that played Warren? I have no idea. Hey, we can look it up. First, look it up, uh, Bob, because I, I don't know. The second James Bond guy, Lazenby. George Lazenby. I you know, look it up? Look no, you look it up. I'm going to go to the next question okay. while you're like, just let me know when you got it, Bob. Uh, let's see. Where did we leave off here? Okay. Joe Snyder has a question that I'm sure you hear some form of a lot. He says, as we all know, facial hair was in fashion during the Civil War and Tom Berenger's beard was obviously fake. Mm. Was his mustache... What kind of question is this? Was his mustache the real deal? And did anyone else go full out besides the reenactors? Well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, Martin Sheen went full out. He, no, he that was his beard. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it was. No, it wasn't. They added to it, but it really? was his beard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But not his real hair. Cause uh, his hair is like white. Right. That's gotta be a wig. I don't remember. I, yeah. I don't remember. So they, so we, but they did. They still had the, uh, plaster a lot of hair on him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Behringer did not have a mustache. So the beard and the mustache is all right. fake. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. <laughs> that's the great tragedy of Gettysburg. It's the great tragedy. Yeah. Um, Ron had the best beard guy in the business out of Hollywood 
and he was too expensive and TNT would not pay for it. Oh, really? Right. So we got Alan Apone's company. Alan Apone's a great guy. He does great practical effects. He's got a, a studio in, um, in North Hollywood, uh, uh, but he wasn't, he wasn't a specialist and, and something like that. You have to get somebody yeah. that that's all they do. They only do beards and maybe wigs. That's mm-hmm. it. And, um, they just didn't want to, it wasn't in the budget. So we had Alan Apone come in and do it to the best of his ability. And, you know, of course, one of the worst, uh, reviews was, uh, the, the movie about beards, you know, <laughs> Uh, Tom's beard was terrible. It, you know, it, it, it's just because there's that one shot where his beard is excited, yeah, and it's sticking out yeah. instead of hanging down. Hanging down and right, I know it was like, that was so unfortunate. You yeah, know? I've never really talked to to Tom about it. You know, um, about how he really felt about the whole beard thing. Um, but I, I know it was a big problem, and, and it was a big problem the whole film. Um, as a matter of fact, they slapped a, the the goatee. Let's see. I don't. I think I just had the mustache and not the goatee. I refused to wear it. I looked so bad that, and they were like, "Nope, sorry, you have to, you know, in makeup." And I'm like, "I'm not wearing this goatee. It looks too bad. I look like a high school kid in a, in a play. I look like a kid in a high school play. Right. Right. You know. And so um, they said, "Well, that's, you know." Uh, sorry, you don't have a choice in this. You have to wear it. So I marched in to Ron's uh, trailer on the day we you know, started shooting, and I said, Ron, I look ridiculous. Please don't make me wear this. I'll, let me wear the mustache. And he looked, and he goes, oh, Bo, that looks horrible. Okay, just wear, <laughs> just wear the mustache. <laughs> so, so that you're wearing fake? Uh, yes. Really? I can't grow a mustache to oh, save really? my life. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, okay, yeah, the baby face, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Um, all right, we'll see, but yours doesn't look that bad. No, no, no. I mean, the mustache that worked, I thought, you know, yeah, but oh, if I'd have had the whole goatee thing going for me, it would have, it just looked silly. Yeah. Just my face did not fit it. You know, it is, it is amazing how just that one, just the one Tom Berenger erect yeah. beard thing just, <laughs> Well, and there was an, a line at one time looked like a rubber band that had like he put the, the 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 beard on just with a rubber band and just snapped it on the back of his head and it was like right you see the line going right it's a beard you get in Party chin. City yeah oh no, no, gosh oh uh, man it's, well it's, it's such a distraction because the movie's so good <laughs> yeah and, and the characters the actors are everybody that played. Were, they were just so right on. See, I film. mean, and, and people and then love you mess it. Mess it up with the beard, you but know? people love it in spite of the I know, beards. I know. They're in fact, it's one of the things they love about the movie really? is the beard. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. It's, people <laughs> always great. make jokes about the beards, but <laughs> it's know. it's not like that movie sucks because of all the beards. That's it's true. like I love this movie in spite of the beards. Like right, it's right. Just, it's just you know, and that's the thing is like you really did. Uh, like it's, I don't, I don't know if cult classic is the word, but I think it is. I mean, it kind of that. is right. So many people watch this movie every year and, and you know, they watch and, it with their kids and, and watch it with their kids. It's a family people. Families watch this film. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and what, what I found funny was at the screening in 2018, right. If of the, of the director's cut here, yeah. there was some 800 people in that theater. Yeah. And, Everybody knew every line and they were laughing at every little joke. I remember that. Yeah. And it was the first time that I realized that there were jokes in the movie because I always took it very seriously. Yeah. And you know, from the, from that opening chord, an actor in the, uh, we, we move on, a, on yeah. the words of an actor, of an actor. <laughs> yeah. We don't have much of a oh, choice. Very good actor, sir. You know. <laughs> uh, Oh yeah, and then you know I drive past that barn where um, where they shot the hood scene where Hood you know lost his arm and yeah. or was being operated on or whatever, and then Longstreet comes out and he talks to Harrison out there and every time I go past it I go all the world shall be in love with night. <laughs> and, like, if I'm in the car with somebody like what the hell are you talking about? Like, oh, never mind. I love it. But yeah, I mean it's. Uh, it, it, people love this movie and, and it just continues to grow and uh, it's great. All right. Well, let, let, what was yeah. it like working with Richard Jordan? Uh, God bless Richard Jordan. I knew him before 
uh, bef- before we did the film. Ron and I would go, he had this rock house in Malibu, an old rock house built in the 20s. And we would go up there and uh, sit on his, ba- he had a raised balcony, a rock balcony, and uh, where he tended to his roses. He had a rose garden, and uh, we'd go up there and, and uh, visit with him a lot, uh, before, way before, a year or two years before we did the movie. Um, he, he was just a, kind of a, he was just a great man, good guy. He was um, a renaissance man, you know? You know, um, uh, working with him was great, but it was, oddly enough, I started seeing the change while we were shooting the film. There was something you could see in his eyes that had shifted, and I, I feel like I knew him pretty well. And, um, you know, he had brain cancer. Mm-hmm. And, did, uh, did he know at that time? No. He didn't find out until he did uh, a physical for uh, The Fugitive. He was, he was originally supposed to be, I, don't, I think it was the... Uh, the Jones character, Tommy Lee, jo- oh, Tommy Lee Jones character, I think he was going to play that role oh, originally. Wow. And um, he found out he had uh, a brain cancer and dropped out of the show and got the operation. I saw him one one other time after the operation. And then he uh, he just wouldn't see anybody after that. He just, you know, tended to his roses and his uh, Blair Brown was his ex-wife and she came up to help take care of him and and uh he just passed you know and was there any mention of him in the 2018 reunion there yeah, should have been I think you know, so I don't, was there i don't believe there was I think, no i think ron said something about him Did when he, he got okay, up because i got yeah. in late I, I was a little late to yeah no i'm ron. pretty sure ron mentioned him in yeah. the in the speech he gave he and ron were really good friends yeah for a long time. Now here's here's something uh, on Amazon Prime. If you watch the movie, you know how it has a little trivia that you can look at. I don't know if you know this, but mm-hmm. when you go on Amazon Prime and watch a movie, it's got trivia that tells you about the making of the movie or whatever. You know, anachronisms and all these other little things. Well, it claims that while they were editing the scene when Armistead gets shot. Mm-hmm. They got the news that Richard Jordan had died. Do you know anything about this? No, uh, that's not correct. That's not, that's not correct. Okay. No, it's not accurate because Ron called me at home in Los Angeles and said, I'm just calling you to let you know that Richard Jordan passed away tonight. Okay. So, um, yeah, no, it wasn't during he, Richard Jordan died before we shot way before we shot gods and generals. Yeah. Right. Oh, so, yeah. No. Yeah. Right. Well, right. No. The, so, supposedly he died while the editing was being done for Gettysburg. I'm sorry. I completely misunderstood you. Um, I think that that could be correct because uh, I know that we had a, a party at Ron's house. A lot of cast members came and he came as okay. well. Okay. Uh, Richard did. And th- that's before the movie was finished. So uh, that could be correct. That's a Ron Maxwell uh, question there. Well, if he'll ever answer my email, I'll ask him. Really? <laughs> I've, been, yeah. oh, I've invited him on after the screening. I invited him on and he gave me his email, but he never oh, answered me. So. I'll, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah. when, I, when I see him again, I'll say Give something. him a hard time. Tell yeah. him this is the biggest show he, ever. He was uh, you know, one of my mentors. I mean, I, he allowed me to sit with him while he directed both movies i sat with him and watched him work and watched everything on on the monitor with him and you know and i sat with the editors in the at night i would go in and watch him edit and stuff so i mean he gave me a lot of access and just was always had you know he's 10 years older than i am so you know he was one of my first mentors you know his him being a director that's pretty cool yeah um, all right. I just got a text that we have to be out in 15 minutes. Okay, so let's, let's do, let's do this lightning speed. Okay. Okay. Let's go. All right. Ready. Dr. Pauly D asks, knowing what you know today, is there anything you would have done differently about your portrayal of Walter Taylor? Go. No, I okay. would not. There's nothing I would do different. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, Keith Harvey is next and he says, good afternoon, Matt, Bob. We don't have time for that, Keith. Bo, was there any valuable lesson you learned while taking part in the movie Gettysburg? Any big takeaways that helped your film career later on? Um, I gained a, a tremendous respect for our history, our, our, our country, our, our, our country's history. 
Um, and as far as pushing my career along, you know, this, that's not the kind of movie that would push my career along in, in uh, Hollywood. Hollywood didn't even want to make this movie. Right? Yeah, I right, mean, right. Just, they don't care. They're Civil War, <laughs> Smivel War, I've heard them right. say. <laughs> All right. Um, a fellow named Alvaro Bo sends a lay all the way from Hawaii. He says, Aloha, Matt. I have a question for Bo Brinkman. What was it like working alongside Martin Sheen, Tom Berenger, and the Hollywood actors in Gettysburg? Were they approachable, helpful, or more distant? Well, I think we kind of covered on that, they right? They were so touched helpful. On that. I, I did not meet one guy in that movie that I didn't like. I mean, I loved everybody there. Martin Sheen was awesome. He was he was so terrific. As I said before, Tom Berenger has become a lifelong friend. Um, and uh, I actually have done several movies with Tom, mm -hmm. uh, smaller films, and we've done together. And, and uh, we just have a great time every time we get together. Um, uh, I was just texting with him last week. Um, uh, everybody, everybody on that movie uh, was was uh, a very giving actors. Ron has a, a real talent of finding t uh, you know actors that are just really good at heart. Mm -hmm. You know, there yeah. was no prima donnas, nothing. It was, it was a dream. Uh, I, I, it was a dream to work with all, everybody. That's yeah. the sense I, I get from having to talk to, or having talked to Patrick and, and yep. you Norman, yeah. about this. And everybody seems like everybody just had a great time. We just had the best. It was one of the best movies I've ever worked on. I mean, why would you be a jerk if you're doing what you love know, right? and you're getting paid, well, right? You, know, you give some actors uh, guns and swords and put them on horses. <laughs> what else is there? We all exactly. dream of doing these yes, things. Exactly. Right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, David Sobosley, I think is how you say it. Sorry, David, if I botched that. He says, I know this is a generic question, but what did Bo know about Gettysburg before his role in the movie? And has he made a point to come back and visit and learn more about the battle? We kind of touched on that, but, you know, give him a short yeah. answer. Uh, well, um, I've, I've been coming back uh, off and on. I, uh, up until 2001, I came back many times. And then I had, uh, to, oh, uh, wait. We had uh, we had uh, 2005 or seven. We had uh, I came back for New Year's and we had dinner oh. at the Cash Town for okay. our New Year's Eve dinner. Uh, some neighbors of mine in Texas and Chris. Uh, so I've been coming back. There's just been a, a swath of time that I haven't. Okay. You know, I lived in East Africa for ten years. Um, and what was the second uh, part of the question? Were they, were, blah, 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 blah. Oh, um, uh, let's see. Where are we here? Uh, what did you know about uh, Gettysburg before your role in the movie? I, nothing until I started uh, reading about it. That okay. was the gift is getting to do all the research for this film um, and, and walk in the battlefields. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was uh, Gettysburg is a gift to me. It's a gift to a lot of us. Um, all right. Evan Clapsaddle asked, was it difficult to change your natural Texas accent into Walter Taylor's Virginia accent? No, because I'd already lost the Texas accent to, because in Hollywood, they want you to have a general American accent. Mm. So I'd already kind of lost it. Um, and so we had a dialect coach, a very famous one on set who I'd worked with 20 years before to get rid of my Texas accent. <laughs> <laughs> and now he was teaching us to do the uh, Virginia Southern accent. So, okay. Um, so that's, ah. that's all right. And we got one, uh, we got one last one here. Uh, Donald J. Lepetamine Copper wants to know, do you have any Civil War connections like an ancestor or two? Uh, no, there's just one story that uh, my great grandparents used to talk about. Their niece, uh, the house was raided and a Yankee was uh, taking all the belongings out of the house. And uh, this one man came up and yanked a locket off of her uh, neck. Hmm. And uh, she cussed this man upside down. I mean, just <laughs> words that the parents had never even heard. And they were everybody was astonished. The parents were astonished, and so was the uh, the soldier. And so he gave the locket back. And that's the only thing I can remember about us, our, our family in the Civil War. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Bo Brinkman, uh, you have you you don't have social media, right? You're not into that whole thing. I, I'm not a big social media yeah. guy. No. Okay. So um, I guess there's no. Well, let's see. You have a website at least. No, I don't. I don't Jesus even have a Bo. website. No. It's 2020. I, I know. I'm terrible. I really am. Well, me, I guess Facebook, neither, you can find well, me on, but it's it's the way the way to be. <laughs> me neither. Why would you have a website? 
I have no oh, social media. Oh, oh, it's social media. It's the gotcha. No, it's, it's horrible. We actually think it's horrible stuff. Anyway, Bo, thank you very much for doing this. Your second, I think you're the first actor we've had who's been on twice, if I'm not mistaken. Oh. I think, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. So, thank you for doing it. Um, Absolutely. My pleasure. Enjoyed and thank, it. Thank you all for sending your questions. And thank you to the American Battlefield Trust for allowing us to use Robert E. Lee's headquarters. Pretty cool. I've never been in here before, Bob. Absolutely. And it's thank a you, really Chris, neat, too. You want to give your business a plug? Yeah. What's your business? Uh, go ahead. It is 60 East Hair Design. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Very good. So if you ever come to town and you want to get your hair done, go to 60 East Hair Design. All right. All right. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the show. It's Thanks. It's been a big pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Great. Thank you both. Just in the nick of time. Oh, is that you? And actually, out of all the scripts, it's my favorite one. So oh, really? Under a mimosa. Yeah. We'll look forward to Where do you get the ideas for the movies you write? Uh, Random places, or do you? Are we on again? Uh, it's recording again, but I just, just want to. Um, it's funny. I, I like... actually hold on. I'm going to make this a question that I'll put in. So let oh, me just do it later. Sure. Where do you get the ideas for the movies that you write? Um, the one I'm doing in 2021. Um, I got my brother-in-law was a DA in a small Texas town and um, he prosecuted this case that was fascinating to me and I got the court documents and uh, I went to the guy that he prosecuted and got the the story and uh, huh. it's um, it, it's about a preacher who falls from the grace of God to avenge his brother's murder because of a gross miscarriage of justice ah and becomes infiltrates into the drug world and becomes the man that he's look you know for so he kind of becomes the person that he's yeah. actually looking to kill it's like that nietzsche and, quote about uh what is it beware of becoming a monster when chasing monsters or, yes, or something it, like that well that's exactly yeah. it like a pawnbroker in the microphone bobby hi there you go <laughs> what'd you say <laughs> no one will recognize my reference to the pawnbroker Never mind. Go on. <laughs> it's an older movie, man. Sorry. Okay. So, yeah, no, this is this just an action. It's not gratuitous violence. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, this, the preacher came from a very factional uh, church in Missouri, and he came to San Antonio to, to find this guy because the guy that killed his brother, he, he got five years probation for flipping on another dro uh, bigger uh, dope dealer, and he got five years probation for his, beat oh. his head off with a cedar stump. You know? oh. And so, oh, anyway, geez. it's action packed what happened. All the stuff that happened is just, you can't write this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Lee, um, Lee Majors is going to play the, uh, this uh, retired Texas Ranger nice. the, who is, was the, um, the investigator for my brother in law when he was a DA. Um, Lee Majors or the Ranger? No, no. no okay. the, uh, the famous Texas Ranger, he was retired at the time. But when they arrested the guy they thought that did this murder in the beginning uh, out on Goat Hill Road, um, the Texas Ranger retired said, you know, I've been, he said, I've been, and this is what he really said. He said, I've been arresting people for 50 years, and I can usually tell if they're innocent or guilty the minute I slap the cuffs on them. I'm telling you, this guy didn't do it. And my brother-in-law said, we've got six witnesses. He has no cooperating uh, alibi. We've got six witnesses, eyewitnesses who, who have identified him at this dance. And uh, he's driving the same kind of car and the same tattoo, J JD, on his shoulders. He mm -hmm. says, this guy, I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm going to push for a true bill from, and uh, get him for murder one. And the, D and the uh, Texas Ranger retired steps uh, started doing more investigation and it, and it turned out to be this uh preacher who's huh. who the guy that was murdered had killed his brother 
Right. Right. So uh, it, it's um, it's just a wild story. It's uh, it's really a, it's a cool. Texas and did you say drama. this is coming out or you're writing this currently? No, no. I'm. It's ready to go. It's, it's ready to go. Uh, yeah, we've got Lee Majors is playing. Uh, it's actually not a big role, but he's playing uh, the retired Texas Ranger. Um, Jake Busey is playing the DA. We've got, uh, I've been talking to Tom Berenger about doing a, a role in it. Um, and yeah, we've got a few people that, that really love it, love the script and want to do it. So is there a part for a podcaster sure. in it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can play a, sure. a sheriff. Just, just make sure in... Berenger doesn't make any eyes at him. <laughs> yeah. You know, I got it. Oh, know, oh, as a sheriff. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I hope, yeah. I hope Tom plays sense. a role. He's, he, he can be tough to get sometimes, but I'm, I'm hoping that he'll come in. 